I am unashamed. What about you? Put your, he- put your headphones on. Yeah, because we can't hear you. And look, you got to remember when you... Because that way you can hear yourself. It's because you're way too far away from the mic. Just FYI. This is fun for our viewers. This is this is how the sausage is made. <laughs> well, I, I, to... I never I never like to cut that part because I want people to know this is just like an ever it's transforming. Like we've entered the eighteen hundreds out, and we're like, okay, this is a microphone. These are earphones. This is being broadcast in virtual reality. It feels just like do what? Well, Dad's <laughs> always like Dad for years. I've always, my line for you when I'm out speaking and stuff is my dad was born a hundred years too late. Like you actually probably would. I mean, you're a pretty big deal, I guess for this last century, but there's no telling what they'd be talking about you. If you'd have been born a hundred years before you were Yeah. in 1846. Yeah. I, I, there's more well. than, there's more than one day. I feel like I'm in a time war. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's why when I metal detect, I'm literally going back in time. So me and Murray, my buddy, who got me into metal detecting, who who's your age? Who, by the way, was one of the inventors of the mojo. Yeah, the duck. spinning I've decoy about him yeah. before. Who knows everybody who's a farmer because he likes to metal detect. So was he a, when you because you first met? Was he a non-Christian and then came to Christ, or was who's he that? Murray Crow? Yeah, we told that story on the podcast. Yeah. I I was shared was Jesus with his okay. daughter. Okay, that's right. Brought of the Lord. His mom, her her mom was. A believer and then murray was like i don't want to have anything to do with it but <laughs> through the years he met you and he came to the lord hey he's one of my best friends i love you oh i love yeah. him he's one of my favorites and uh, he's been he, my biggest fans on that for my preaching he was diagnosed with cancer and he's just had a real tough battle but i'm gonna tell you that joker when I mean, we went out there saturday it's 95 degrees we're in a bean field where a town used to be and it's just now it's just fields and uh, he had hunted that area before, but <clears throat> he's always been a Civil War buff. And I'm like, look, okay. I went once with him on that. Yeah. Found a few bullets and some buttons off a of Yeah, but something. I'm like, you know, okay. <laughs> Let's find some coins. <laughs> Let's find some silver, man. <laughs> and I kept preaching to him about that Luke 15. I mean, it's biblical. You know what I mean? <laughs> We're sweeping the house and finding the lost coin lost and coins. joy. It brings joy. I mean, let's do this. So I finally talked him in to start going to that. The people like him, don't, they don't like hunt, hunting old towns because they call it track. You, you're going through, just imagine a whole town being devastated and plowed under, and then you run a metal detector on top of it. There's more sounds going on in your head <laughs> <laughs> but every once in a while, you get your settings right, and you find a little round silver coin, and it just bleep, 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 bleep. It's like singing clear music, and you stop everything. So, so I'll play the role of, of dad on this one for vacation. I don't. I, I when do you get to the? What's the fun part of that? Because that, that's the fun part. You're sweating. You're grueling. You're yep. running across. Your sounds in your head. I, mm-hmm. you know, I can't even hardly sit on the porch right now. It's but so when hot. I clean up all the stuff that I find that that are interesting, and they may not be valuable. So that's but what, look that's, at all he, he that does stuff. it all for that. Dad. You see all that stuff. Yeah, you need. We'll little, show this picture to you, you guys. Need watching. a little. Uh, uh, magnifying glass. signage no you need oh. a little signage <laughs> this is where you end up when you run out of something new <laughs> so look here's the funny part with, with your little stuff it's like one of my yeah. grandsons yeah. that's like found a bunch of crap everything at the beach. meticulously <laughs> spaced out i mean you know you're like yeah okay all right thank you phil um. that was encouraging <laughs> so look my buddy murray finds an 1805 spanish Real, I think that's what it's called. When Spain was here, yeah, I mean they, they uh, a at one time coin from the Spain. Spanish flag flew over Louisiana mm-hmm. at some yeah. point, and we found yeah. a coin. Somebody they, dropped. They it. came right before the French, right, right, right. And I found my prize of the day was an eighteen fifty half dime, which he found an eighteen fifty six half dime. I mean, look, if we find one thing like this in three, so trips, why did they call it a half dime? You know, it's not, good, and not a nickel. 
because the nickel wasn't here yet. Ah, when did the nickel so come in? The nickel came in like 1860, I'm going to say three. I'm sure I got that wrong, but it's somebody, somewhere in the somebody 18... Somebody corrected this. Well, I mean, off the top of my head. I mean, I, I think it's 1860s where the nickel started, and then they started making it out of mainly terrible material because right. they don't hold up well. But I found a buffalo so nickel. So five cents was originally a half dime in coinage for the U.S. That's right. Okay, I got you. And so I found a buffalo nickel Saturday. Uh, it was... 1934, I think. Of course, well, there. You know, didn't they get it down to the Jason and figured out, you know, the three cent piece? I found yeah. it. Th- that was at my plantation that I. That and I, I wondered uh, about that, but then it occurred to me a penny would go and a dime would really go way further mm. than it would now. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it was. Oh, oh yeah. That, that, you that, had, this you was had a lot of money. 20 or 30 cents in your pocket. Yeah. You oh, yeah, you were you would have been if somebody had just had what you found. Oh, yeah, they'd of course. Pretty, now they're you know they're worth a few hundred dollars, I guess. That half dime. I, I mean, it's in spectacular condition. And uh, but here's what's funny. And then Murray found an 1856 uh, real dime. It has an eagle on the back. I forgot because they're all you know they would make them and call them this and that. There's different variations in a it. it this thing was spectacular looking. We find I find you see all that stuff I found. Jep, he so found, Jep went. Jep was in town. He went. Jep with was you. in town. He went, but he's a rookie. He's only been doing it for <laughs> just a little bit, and there was so much trash out there. Jep is still looking in the the change areas of Mom's vehicle. He was in my truck rooting yeah, around. Yeah, he's, he he's still looking for stuff in the truck. I, I'm like, yeah, yeah but you're, all you're going to find is just yeah, it's my change. loose chains. That's he not doesn't really. understand. Well, he's thinking <laughs> he's trying to find these. I mean, rare he wants to just coins. lay it out for him on the ground. You know, like somebody he, coming on dropping you know 1850 stuff. That's the term, Ricky. So look, <laughs> we we all day out there, and Jelp finds one musket ball, <laughs> which is cool. So but, you got your whole blanket. <laughs> Full of trinkets. He has one got. musket ball and a bunch of nails and rebar. <laughs> and just, he kept I, – I went over there one time. He had a four-foot hole. That doesn't even surprise Look, me. Look, he has a four-foot hole. I said, Jeff, what are you doing? He said, well, Murray thinks this this may be a uh, uh, <laughs> a brain cramp. Uh, the end of a, of the rifle uh, with the a bayonet. Bayonet. He said, Murray – I was like, that's not a bayonet. That <laughs> – I don't know what that is, but you're you're gonna need a bigger shovel. If you're gonna, he's like, I'm like, that's why Jeff found one musket ball because he's, he's been busy an hour digging a four foot hole. Yeah, digging up some piece of metal that had something that looked like a spear on the end up, but it wasn't. It was just a big hunk of metal. I was like, Jeff, you need to, you know, rework your settings. You know what I found interesting is the farmer pulled up, who's given Murray the permission and he was uh 87 and he and look everything they tell you to do to live long it was obviously he had not done that <laughs> he was a huge guy but he made yeah. it to 87 he's 87 <laughs> walking around in 95 degree weather he overweight just, overweight yeah and one of the nicest people you ever ever gonna meet he's, and i'm sure he's eating good every day like he's eating stuff out of his garden and just slaughtering pigs and funny guy he was like he said i don't know why y'all y'all come out here that's the first thing he said i don't know why y'all come out here murray murray's like we had already found two or three silver coins i was thinking well i know why we come out here <laughs> you know and uh he said i've hunted this thing a hundred times he said there's been more people out here you know and murray's like well we're look what we found he was he was looking like <laughs> you found that out here <laughs> so Yep. And Murray's like, well, I'm sorry. We didn't mean to find your church. He said, oh, I quit this. And Murray said, well, what'd you quit it for? He said, well, one day I bent down and I couldn't get back up. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's all of this. Time to, time to shut her down. And he said, I left that metal detector right there. And he said, I've never been back. He said, y'all probably find it out here at some point. <laughs> You'll probably find it up underneath. <laughs> he said, it looks like a Jeff will dig a hole looking for it. He said, come look at my gun I just bought. So we walked over his truck. I thought he was going to show me a gun. <laughs> it was just some pieces of metal, and I said, well, well, "What? What is it?" He said, "It's a do-it-yourself. It was a four ten that you put together. It, it was just three or four pieces of metal." I said, "Well, where's the trigger?" He's like, "You pump it, and you shoot it." I said, 
Well, you you look like you got plenty of money. Why didn't you just buy one and you just pull the trigger? <laughs> he said, well, that's no fun. I guess so, that's what so happens. So then I gave him a duck call. I said, well, let me give you a duck call for letting him. He said, I don't, I don't want one. And I was like, you're the first man I've ever offered a duck call. I was like, it makes a party favorite. He said, no, I just, you know, I eat chickens. I said, <laughs> Okay, well, let me just give it to you, and you give it to one of your grandkids. But he was a he was a marvelous, marvelous fellow. That's pretty anyway, awesome. Anyway, that's what we did. Well, Phil, I want to hear about this uh, this project. The water came up, and I don't like this plan that I heard. This is the first time we're discussing this because I heard from the middleman, which is Jay, which is your son-in-law. He said, Phil's thinking about doing something really crazy because the water came up. <laughs> And it was up Shocker. for months, and then it goes down. But you look out there because we're going to plant our our duck hole, but the water's not leaving, and so there's a problem that has occurred. I'll let you describe the problem. Well, when you have a levee system and a way to drain your duck water, we drain the duck water so it won't kill all the oak trees. Put it on it artificially. We pump it up and. A month before duck season, we start pumping. When we get it at the right depth, we shut down the pump, and we just wait on the rains. Well, that's what we did last year when duck season started last November. Well, about <clears throat> duck season started in November and December and January, and we were still basically, it was not too deep at the last of duck season, which is the last of January. Well, in February, the river began to rise. It backs, it backs in there. What we, we pumped up, the backwater comes. It's been four in a row, and the river rises. Each year, the last four years, has risen from 21.2 to 47.5 this year. And 40 is flood stage. Consider. 40 is flood stage, but just think about it, a river going and from— 50 is— in the we're house. All, we're yeah. we're on the levee. We're on the news. Yeah. yeah, basically just under 30 feet straight yeah. up. Right. Well, you can imagine all your levee systems and all your pipes and all of your everything it's except the floating water. duck line. Right. Water's way, way over them. Well, you wait till all that water begins to fall out. Well, when it fell out, it got down on the top of the levees, and when it come off the top of the levees, I go down there and make sure that water in that 48 inch pipe water is flowing out we we get it in in the winter we take it out in the spring and the midsummer however long it stays the backwater but the backwater started falling out so dad well, hold, hold on one second so i want to take a break so when you're running a business uh human resources uh can uh be tough because obviously you got all these lawsuits, you got everything going on kind of in our American culture in 2020. Humans are difficult. Humans are difficult. Hmm. And so we have to figure out a way to manage that, right? So most companies and corporations have a human resources department. They're taking care of all these things, but it's very expensive. Um, you know, you're talking about whatever you'd have to pay to, to hire somebody. So small businesses, you know, they, they suffer and have a tough time with this. So there's a company uh, that has provided something really good uh, that can help you guys. you got a small business. You need to have some things for your employees, but you're not exactly sure where to go. The name of the company is Bambi, B-A-M-B-E-E. -E. And so basically they provide a dedicated HR manager. They can craft your policy, maintain compliance, all that. It's $99 a month, so instead of paying a salary, it's it's very affordable. Um, and basically you can get to them by phone, email, or real time chat, which is these day and age is really good. So month to month, no hidden fees, cancel anytime, uh, go to bambi.com, B-A-M-B-E-E.com slash Robertson. You get a free audit and find out if these guys can help you. And I also want to mention as you finish your story that if this kind of stuff really interests you. You need to subscribe on on Blaze TV slash Unashamed to Dad Show in the Woods with Phil because we chronicle everything you're talking about. Dad literally takes you through the process, and we have shows about it. So if you're interested in that, check it out. Go ahead. Dad. You know, we have one pipe over right now on the dog. We call it. It's it's a little lake. <clears throat> we pump it up every year. We got it down 
to where it should be going through a riser that's tied onto a 36 inch pipe. Every time we tear, the beavers don't want that water to go out of there. They want to keep it in there. I got to take it out of there so I can plant duck food and all that, you know. Well, I got it down to where it was inside the tree line, and we'll tear the beaver dam out today. When we go back the next morning, it's like we never touched it. They've put it all back. No draining. We tear it out. It drains in the daytime. They pack it full. So they're working all night. All night. And by the time they get done, it's like you never touched it. We're talking, <laughs> it's amazing. We're talking really tons amazing. of earth. Yeah. Well, I get down there on the other side on the when they dropped off the levee. There, it's a 48-inch pipe, and we got a plate that just slides down. I raised that plate up when I saw the backwater coming. I said, well, no use in trying to mm – -hmm. Trying to, there's no factor. Well, you didn't want to create the pressure. That's right. So I just raised my plate up and let the backwater 48 inch pipe just blow it in there. Well, it got up, you know, 20 feet deep over that spot. Well, I finally see it somewhere between it going through there. They didn't do it then, but when that river got up at its height and when it started falling out, at some point, the beavers got together and said, "We've got to stop up that pipe." <laughs> so they literally. They I, took had, a, I took a. I took a. Do you a, think they actually had a meeting? Had a meeting. Yeah, <laughs> they had a meeting. I took a pole. Phil says they have and a I, demon, And I reached down there and spirit. I and I jugged that pole up in that pipe, but it didn't go in the pipe. It was just a wall of mud and sticks. Well, four, and a four foot. Pipe. Think about it. You got a forty eight inch pipe like this. You know, forty eight inches. And it's packed full of mud on the front end and logs, and no water is going through there. Well, now the problem is you say you have to get that water out of there. Yeah. So what we're going to do is <laughs> if you go out there and start tearing at that hole, when that beaver down because of the pressure on it, see, the water on the downside is falling out. The water here is way up high. So you've got a – Projectile is what you. You've got the mother of all commode flushes. <laughs> this is like. Oh. So, if you're the man there with with a rake and you're reaching up in there, that thing you're busts gone. loose. You're gone. You probably would live, but you're going to go thirty feet through that culvert at a rapid rate of speed, and it's a wild ride for you. Pop up down on the other end. You could probably survive it, but. It, I don't want to go through that pipe at, at 15 miles <laughs> well, an hour. I, I, Jay was telling me this story. I was like, because he's like, we got a problem. I mean, you got to talk to Phil. And he's, t he's telling me everything you just said. Stone, I'm training him to know what to do when the water is up. <laughs> well, he's calling me and saying, I don't know about this. <laughs> yeah. I said, well, what about dynamite? And he said, well, you don't want to tear up your pipe. Yeah. Well, you said the word while ago, rookie. So I'm teaching them about water. <laughs> that was so gym. what we're going to do is we're going to take a track hole, pull up on the the levee where the pipe is. Look, cut a 20-foot long bitter pecan tree, a tree about like this at the butt. Down there where the limbs come out of it, up there, up there, you know, you, you got to get the right kind of tree, the limb coming out right. Well, you take one of the limbs about – one and a half inches to two inches where those limbs start out you cut that tree off and you leave you a prong on the end of that pole the prong will be a limb here a this limb is here. real life this yeah. is, i'm just i mean only on our show would anybody be be thinking this you now. have a pole a, a, a log a, a oh. fair-sized tree with a prong on the end of it okay so, hook your track hole to the butt end here's your hole I get the get that prong stuck up in there. He takes the backhoe, and when he pulls that blade forward, it tears that mud and them sticks out of there on the top of that mud. It's a roto rooter. It's a roto rooter. That's the plan. And Jay said, "What do you think about that?" I said, "I think someone's going to get hurt. You better have a really skilled track hoe operator." Jimmy Red. Oh. And I think the local you, redneck. No matter what happens, Boy, this, this you plan just got more dangerous. <laughs> the third thing is no matter what happens, you must film this. Oh yeah. This is must this this will be filmed for in the woods of Phil. This has to because there's gonna be something it's epic. It's a pretty good project, but I, mean, I, mean, I don't have a better plan. Well but, what I heard the original plan was before this was hatched was 
dad told Jay, he said, yeah, Stone, you can just swim out there with this thing you're building and start in on it. He said, but it, you'll have to get out. <laughs> you'll have when it when the thing it's breaks. It's too dangerous to have a man <laughs> doing it because if a man doing it, that all that mud well, gives way. Well, didn't this happen what before the dad on rope? the other side of the pipe one time where he oh, yeah. the projectile just blew past him? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I've been just – you know, blown off my feet. Before Sometimes the little. plugs of mud and stuff are like 10, 10, 10 foot, uh, 8, 10 foot around. It's just mud and logs. And I have, we have juked them with, me and Dan got on there, we'd run the pole. We were in the water. We were running, you know, and kept gouging by hand that log. When it finally gave way, I mean, when I saw what <laughs> happened, I mean, that plug came out. I said the mother of all commode places, <laughs> this is like about a 10-foot long, this big around of mud and stick, just projectile going out the end. Water is powerful. Because you can't just get a backhoe because it's up in the pipe? Up in the yeah. pipe. You can't, get a, you can't get up in there, you except for the stop. pole. We're going to have a pole there. <laughs> You're doing this. I can tell. Oh, it's, ha- it's oh, going to yeah. happen. Yeah. It's- That's in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to know from you our wonder what I do. I'm done. Say, does anybody else in the world? Is anybody else in the world going to be doing what what Dad is doing? You'll have tomorrow? to remember. Basically. You you get on the black box and you hire you an engineering uh, firm to figure this out, or you use redneck ingenuity and get out there and say, I think what we'll do is tie a large pole with some prongs on the end. And get a track hole down there and tie onto that and just pull that forward. I mean, that pole I, is going to go. I like it's going to fact, tie out whatever. I like the fact that that you've planned out the cutting of the tree, the size, yeah, the looking I'll, of the prong. I mean, this thing is like a, I'm driving through the woods, leaving there after <laughs> looking I looked for at the, the tree, problem. Right? And I'm looking on my right and on my left, and I see a tree, and I back up. I said, "Stone, see that tree right there." <laughs> And I pointed over it to you. Because you got to be long and straight, right? Yep, oh, straight yeah, as I an arrow. I, I'm buying the plan. This was and, and I me. see the limbs coming off of it. I said, "That's about a 15 footer." <laughs> I said, I, "I think there's our tree." So I'm on, and I wanted one as close as I could get to the pipe because that that a, a tree that long is heavy. Yeah. So I got to have a trailer. So but we're gonna get the track. You got to have a trailer. You're basically, taking a big toothpick for a for a dam and just that's right. And then you're, and you're plunging. I it told up. Jay that I was like, "This it's sounds a like an rooter. idea." It's a rotor rooter type deal. Right, right. That it sounds like an idea that Phil had after he was eating a steak and he had his toothpick and thought, "Yeah, I just no. need to get a tree." And but just all I grab can, it with all I can tell you all, the it, reason I know it. it'll work is I've done it before. <laughs> I've done Have you done before. it with the track hoe too, or just? Yeah, I've done it with the track hoe. Oh, I've done it. I've done the whole gee, thing. Whiz, where was I at? This will work. Oh man! So, so the question is, Jay's, Will all this like one of these days, and hopefully it's not for a long, long time, but dear old dad will be in heaven waiting on us to get there. And is it, are we going? Is he going to be able to pass this on to the next generation? Because I don't know. I wouldn't instantly think of that. I, I would be. I, I don't know. Everybody I wouldn't come up. People with that. who hunt uh, old coins <laughs> on the ground. <laughs> They don't participate in this kind of stuff because what what we're doing here is this is mission critical. Finding old coins is not mission critical. It's just I've run out of something to do. Let's walk around. I've got plenty of money in my pocket. I think everybody has their personalities. And look, mine, I've said this before on this very podcast, which is very frustrating to my wife. I'm terrible at fixing things. I'm great at destroying them. So what I would do is I would blow it up, yeah. and I would buy another pipe. Yeah. That's just what I would do. Yeah. I would blow the whole thing and start over, and get I'd get somebody if you'll else. Pay, if you'll pay for half the pipe, a 48-inch pipe, 30 feet long is a pretty expensive piece of pipe. Oh, that's a lot. But you're it's... missing something. What you're paying for is you get to witness the explosion. You see what I mean? Do you that, get, does that, that give you a thrill to watch something blow up? That's no, that's Duck Dynasty type crap. <laughs> but that's price. It's not real, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but Phil, I like seeing oh the explosions. Goodness. I mean, so so what we just witnessed. Uh, well, let's take a break. So Father's Day is coming up uh, soon. Uh, so Dad, Happy Father's Day in advance. I'm sure we'll tell you. I know you're big on knowing all the holidays. Um, we're always thinking. I saw somewhere where Father's Day is like ranked twentieth 
out of like. Oh, and I bet Mother's Day is high. Oh, everybody loves the mom. I think it's like second. You got Christmas and Mother's Day, you know. (laughs) (laughs) What is it about that? You know, I don't know. I mean, there's like things you've never heard of that are better than Father's Day or more celebrated. I'm like, what? What happened here? So dad is hard to buy for because dad doesn't do much and need much. I mean, you're pretty low maintenance. In yep. terms of, and you don't really, you're not into gifts much. And, you know, every once in a while we'll get him a gun mm-hmm. or something. But, you know, how many how many of those do you need? So I found a good gift for you, dad. So I, I'm, I'm gonna, really on the edge of my seat here. So this is a good one. And this is because I love this product. So this is uh, one of our new sponsors uh, just recently. Tommy John. Oh. Tommy John makes the most comfortable underwear that you can ever imagine because and i know you need an upgrade because I, I i've seen what you're still back you're still going back from the where well, you were when you were maybe in the 60s six years old yeah yeah, yeah. He, he's he's tidy yeah, it's time for an upgrade yeah. i'm telling you it's it's the most softest breathable fabric ever uh i've been wearing them for a long time so i love this product so if you get your order before june 17th uh, that'll ensure that you can get it for fathers. I'm telling you, you try this. Your dad is going to love you if you get this to him. Um, in fact, they're so confident in their underwear. If you don't love your first pair, you get a full refund with their best pair you'll ever wear or it's free guarantee. That's how That's how much they stand behind these. I don't want to be filmed ha- wearing them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, no, I, we don't me. want them. None watching. of us want that I'm either. Just saying, I've seen some of their advertisement. I said, I'd rather just. You oh, know, you've seen that as before with the other. Yeah, you don't yeah. want to do no, that. We're going to no. talk about it, Phil, but we're not going to model. <laughs> okay. Our model. Nobody's ever come to us and said, would you model this for me? No. <laughs> I'll try them on if no one's looking, you know, like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, they'll come to my wife and ask her to mop, but me, no. I don't care how they look, but. <laughs> But he made a little statement. They're comfortable. They are. Well, very that's comfortable. that's what he said. All right, so I'm like, what, yeah. Here's what you that. do. Here's what you do. You go to tommyjohn.com slash feel. Tommy Don, <laughs> tommyjohn.com slash feel. You get 25% off your first order. It's pretty good. Say 25%. Uh, check them out. Go to their website and get some comfortable underwear for your dad. I'm going to get you some, Dad, but we don't want to see it. No, you'll never see me in them. <laughs> So what we just witnessed on the Unashamed podcast, I guess, is why our podcast is so popular because you know all this crap we've been having to watch on TV every day, which is just if you're watching it is, is misery, and that's the hardest I've laughed since the, I guess two weeks. Just just thinking about that one story. So. I heard the story last night. I was like, hmm. I was hearing it from Jay. Well, I, I was like, I mean, I, I was because he was like, you might already go talk to Phil, and, and he's. <laughs> <laughs> they was a little worried he's going to be a projectile. You don't want to follow the plug, that's for sure. Well, I don't want to be any. I mean, you start swinging a tree. That's right. You know, around. I that's, would never, <coughs> under any circumstances, and I want to stress this, under any circumstances, I would never, ever walk down the street of a city with a sign over my head, showing with some kind of sign. I'm never going to do that, Ever. So well, I'm glad. No to matter know that. how bad it is or how, what happens, it's not your thing. I'm not going to do that ever. Yeah. I never have. So I, I don't know that I'd say I never. Well, have. I think with this podcast, uh, you know, one of the things that happened this weekend was Al preached, and I, I called, I called you. And I was like, Al, of all the sermons I've heard you give, and you preach for twenty something years, I thought that was numero uno. It was, it was very, very well, yeah, you saw very well done. Yeah. But so, it goes to the point. The reason you wouldn't do that, Phil. Is because in Jesus you have something that penetrates the heart. I mean, you think about what the gospel message does, and I don't mean that just as a phrase. I'm like who Jesus is. It makes people pause because he addresses all the mistakes people make, which here we have a mistake that was made, and there's been tons of them. Right. And we have injustice that's occurring. And then on the fringe you have people who are responding improperly right. with the same degrading of other human beings. Yep. So you have more mistakes. Well, here you have Jesus who has an answer for all mistakes, and then he kicks it up a notch and has an answer for our number one problem in life, which is death, which is what occurred that that started all this in this in this moment. And so 
that that's why we tend to not say, well, I, I'm going to go protest. We think, well, we need to keep sharing Jesus with people because I know that shares. I mean, that changes the heart. And right? and look, and the Apostle Paul uh, was. We have it much easier, although we're we're persecuted all all the time. We put no stumbling block in anyone's past so that our ministry will not be discredited. That, that's why I said I'm not going down the road with some kind of sign or some cause. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. Now, what's this list? Here's the Apostle Paul, what he was up against. This is 2 Corinthians 6. In great endurance and troubles, hardships and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, and hard work, sleepless nights, hunger, impurity, understanding, patience, and kindness. Look how good a people, he, he, good a person he was, and the people with him, in the Holy Spirit, in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, <clears throat> with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and the left, he's got the word of God, through glory and dishonor, Bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying yet we live on, beaten yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Well, now that's a guy, all he wanted was for people to come to a knowledge of the truth about Jesus, his death for the sins of the world, his burial and resurrection, eternity, immortality. Come on. He's trying to convince them. And look at that list of things that was happening to him. Because of that, each day has enough trouble of its own, Al, without me <clears throat> getting in the mix and causing I'm not going to – Get on the street with a sign and protest anything. Right. I'm going to fear God and do what's right. I'm going to point people to Jesus. And if I take a cursing, a beating, a boy, all that, you say, you just have to suck it up and keep going. So, so, <clears throat> so that's my view of it. So we talked about on a previous podcast kind of what's going on, obviously, in the country, and, and it's still ongoing. And so we talked a lot about that. The, what my sermon did, I think that kind of – was some things that have happened since, and I just want to set the context for us, then I want you guys to weigh in, is um, in John 6, which we've talked about as well, 1 through 15, <clears throat> was when Jesus had the big fish fry, is what I call it. But, you know, he provided the fish and all that bread, and he had five loaves of bread and two fish, and he miraculously fed at least 5,000 people. Yep. You know, it, and we imagine what that looked like. Was he, you know, Smith used to say he was tearing the bread apart when the bread's falling down, and that was the 12 baskets full of just what they picked up. You know, he's literally creating. And so I made the point uh, <clears throat> that we know that one of the fundamental truths from a human perspective and law is that matter cannot be created or destroyed. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's been. Unless you're God. Unless you're the creator. And so here he is, he's creating out of five loaves of bread. On the spot, enough bread to feed 5,000 at least people, and he's distributing that. Two fish, two little fish, or I don't know how big they were, and he fed them all fish at the same time. So as this is happening, and you know he's doing this to show who he is, but what's interesting, I think what advances the story, is the last point I got to, which to me was really interesting, <clears throat> is that... Here's, so they just witnessed this. They just had their bellies full. And here's what here's what happened. After the people, this is verse 14, John 6. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, he just fed them, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. So they're like, well, this has got to be him. I mean, he just fed us. He fed us from... Thin air. From thin air. and Because, you know, I don't know what they knew about what he had, but they're watching the food. I'm assuming he had a little basket More there. than that, <clears throat> it, it's already, looks like anyway, it's been baked, the bread, That's right. and the fish are done. And they're, and they're done. That's why <laughs> somebody, when you said fish fry, I said that before, and I had somebody, after I spoke one time, they said, well, he couldn't have fried it. I was like, no, wait a minute here. You're going to make an argument where I said it, he fried the fish? 
because he only had two, and he multiplied it to thousands. And now you're saying, well, it couldn't have been fried. <laughs> well, Again, I think it could have been. I think it if you're been. getting it from thin air, why not just go ahead and fry it in some peanut oil? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just it, go ahead. You're letting that stop you from appreciating the what story. What they're going to say is Thomas Jefferson. By the way, uh, my, my old, no matter what happens, we're going to get into Thomas my Jefferson. My old hero in certain matters, old Thomas, he couldn't buy this. He, he he looked at what Jesus said and the way he lived, and he said, that I can't argue with. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a Christian in the sense I hold to what he said a man ought to be like. Right. He was looking at the model of Jesus' life. He said, but when it came to the loaves and the fishes and the resurrection of the dead, Jefferson said, nope. Yeah. No, he never said that, but I just read his writings. Right. When you got to the resurrection, he stopped right there. Yeah. He also never said anything about the loaves and the fishes. Yeah. So the bottom line is, you know, they don't mind saying matter can't be created nor destroyed. They don't mind saying before there was a cosmos, where did it come from? Where did all that matter come from? What was there before the cosmos came into existence? And they say, the atheists and the agnostics and the unbelievers, there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. They don't mind then saying, well, nothing came made something. Nothing. And all of a sudden, it makes the cosmos start there. Well, if nothing made the cosmos, why would they have a problem with the one who said, no, I made the cosmos. Mm. Therefore, the loaves and the fishes is a no-brainer. This is easy. If you can make the cosmos, uh, baking some baked bread, and just it's just coming out of the, the atomic makeup of things. It just... If you control the atoms, you can do anything That's when it comes right. to... No, when I was in... Hang on, in, in, hang on let's take a break. <clears throat> When I was in biology in 11th grade, it, the question was whatever the question was about can matter be created or destroyed. And I was like, yes, God does it all the time. That's right. Bomp, wrong. Because yep. <laughs> I went up there and said, hey, th- th- I believe this. She's like, well, that, that was not the right answer. And I just get, I said, well, mark it wrong. Then. Give me an F. <laughs> <laughs> which he did. Which, which he did. <coughs> which and you, I'm still bitter about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which you've already said you weren't much of a student anyway. So here was my point. Uh, so so they they recognize him in the moment with the full belly. And I think, and, and again, I'm taking a little license here, but I think they're thinking about the possibilities of what this would look like. Here you got a guy Think about you got all the fish. You have all the fish. I mean, the guy can just feed anybody. Oh yeah. So so you talk about an army. You know, people are always worried. How do you feed an army if you're gonna? And they're thinking, well, we got the guy that can. Miss K figured out a long time ago. So so if you feed them, they will come. So yesterday, I told I told the story in that this is like maybe I don't know how long it's gonna. This probably I I remember like thirty five. Me too. And so so dad was. We had just gotten back to WFR, our church, and so dad. Had a class. He, and Stevenson, by the way, texted me during my sermon. So when I get through, I go over there and look at my phone, and Stevenson's watching, I guess, from Colorado. Which Stevenson used, was our first cameraman yeah. for the uh, – For the first probably five Duckman for, videos. For, for yeah. Duckman videos, which is funny because uh, – what did he he's sell the, insurance He's the father. Something? Yeah, insurance. And, and Phil, he's the father of Dan. <clears throat> and he's works Dan's me. dad. Phil went up there and was like, I, you know, I think you'd be a good guy to film you know, our videos because you're steady 80 is what you call him. And he's like, Phil, I sell insurance. <laughs> <laughs> he worked for State Farm. <laughs> now I was like, no, I'm telling you, you got to write, you know. And so. obviously he was. So so Stevenson, by the way, I'll just throw this in. So he gave me a little update. He said that DeLuke, you took over DeLuke's class. I never knew that. Don DeLuke, one of mine and Jason's instructors in school, was teaching at WFR. And then he wasn't after that. And Stevenson was his assistant. And so Stevenson said, you know, I need to get old Rob up here to teach this class because you were still i mean this was you were only been a christian six or seven years at this point mm-hmm. and so that's how you started teaching that class but anyway 
It was about 75 people in the class. It was very popular. I remember it. And and people love coming to it. And you were teaching. And so you said, well, look, let's have a class fish fry down in my house. I'll provide the fish and y'all come eat some fish. And so you're looking at your 75 member class and thinking that's who's going to come to fish I fry. I fish for a living. No problem. So I remember, I remember days like you, like yesterday. So we're getting ready for it and we've, you've caught the fish. We've helped clean them and we're getting ready to fry everything up. And the car started coming. Yeah. And they kept coming. And started stacking up. And then we couldn't even park everybody. Couldn't so. see the end of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I remember thinking, there's nowhere else to park because you're surrounded by water. I was like, So dad's looking at us, and he's looking at all the people because they're just streaming in. So this is just like this moment. Yeah. And they're that class is swelling. <laughs> <laughs> so a class of 75 turned into about 250 people. And so dad looks at us and says, like, boys, go hit the nets. I hope there's yeah. some fish out there. And so Jason and I take off. You, you know, you're starting the process. We got to go catch a bunch more fish, clean them, and like you're I cooking. dressed enough for 75, but I didn't have enough dress for 250. <laughs> That's right. And so Jason and I are like, <laughs> we're like a factory. We're, we're cleaning fish and getting it to you. You keep frying. People keep eating. We had this miracle without the miracle. I mean, <laughs> yeah. we were the, the miracle. miracle is <laughs> blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> the fish were in the nets. So, we, and, you know, well, that's true. And that it was right. taking money because this is like, this is what we would this have sold. This is what sold. we would have sold. That's yep. right. And, so, uh, it, it, But look, I, what I love about Dad is, number one, you never thought twice. You thought, we got people here. We're going to feed them. Which, by the way, is just what Jesus thought, by the way. Remember he said he looked on the crowd in Mark 6, and the disciples are saying, send them, send them on. I would have never walked out in the yard and said, let me tell you folks something. I don't know where you come from. I, I recognize you as members of the church up there. But, you know, this uh, This is for my class. Right. We don't have enough fish. I would have done You never did it. You, you responded. Suck it up and go get some little fish. It, read this, the, the audience, read this in the Mark 6 context because Mark gives a little different flavor. But you don't get it in John. But in Mark, he says, Jesus looked down. The disciples are saying, send them home. Like, send them mm -hmm. to go get something to eat. And Jesus like, no. And that's when he came up with the idea. Miss K was like, what are you going to do? <laughs> that's right. You uh, said, get some more meal. Well, it shows more you the basic human needs or right. weaknesses is they love free fish. That's oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> People I mean, love you, it. You say, come free, <laughs> free fish fry down on the riverbank, they're coming. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> if you cook them. They're coming. I've seen it many a time. Well, and I talked about it in the context of the reason we knew that is because when Dad was first, to, you know, came to Christ, he would have out our preacher and some other of our mentors, the guys that mentored all of us, and they never turned down a fish fry. Well, of course not. Uh, you know why? So, this was Jesus's idea. Exactly. It's not like we came up with it. <laughs> That's right. He and started so breaking you some fish. You cat one time. The next time you get the chance, you'll come back for <laughs> That's more. Right. You're coming. <laughs> You're coming. That's right. And you following. And that's why, he, you know, later he came up there and said, yeah, you're following me around. Not because you think I'm all that great. I mean, that, I'm paraphrasing. But you want some more of that fish and bread. That's exactly right. <laughs> he kind of gives them a little chastise. Let's, let's take our last break. So, so my point is, verse 15, this is where I got in the sermon, which I thought was kind of the most poignant thing about this and this kind of brings it into the current thing so with dad it's a about. very obscure <clears throat> unusual phrased passage it is and it and it struck me I, i'll admit if i had just taught this in any other setting i probably wouldn't have thought about how i illustrated with it but obviously this last week of these protests that led to riots that have led to violence and everything our country's going through so look at verse 15 jesus so remember, they said, he's the prophet, he's him. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain. So so he he's knowing what their intent is. And it was interesting because, and this is what took me into the current climate, is he knew they were going to turn this into a mob scene real quick. We went from a, a fun fish fry and some teaching to their, they've realized that, you know what, we can take, we can overthrow this. We can get free, rid of Rome. Free stuff. Free stuff. Well, just think about that statement. We're going to take Jesus yeah, that's a good point. and make him <laughs> a king by force. He's the Messiah, the prophet. Knowing <laughs> all the grub you want, and it's all free. I've well, heard I, that I, line somewhere I just want to say <laughs> this one statement. 
you can't make <laughs> Jesus do anything. That's right. And nor should you try. That's right. But the more Al brought up this point, the more I, I got to thinking, you know, in small ways and in big ways, in the religious world and in the non-religious world, that's the way humans operate. That's right. We try to take the Godhead or any aspect of it and just force it to fit whatever we want to happen. You say, well, why would they do that? Why would he know that they wanted that? Because they want to dictate policy. You're our king, and this is what you're going to do. That's right. Yep. Here's what we want to do. We want to yep. first take over Rome. We want some more of this fish. <laughs> on, a, I, that, on, a, on our schedule. This is what – there's meetings. <laughs> they in, were looking around saying there's 5,000 of us. He didn't go to town, but he's feeding all of us. We with him. That's right. He said, except uh, on our terms, not on his terms. It's it's, it's the, the the old thing. It just keeps giving. Just keeps giving. So, so here's what's interesting, Jason. And I don't think I, I don't even think I got to this on the. I'm looking at my notes. Look at all the scratches. So I don't even think I got to this on my sermon. But it struck me when when Jesus had this awareness moment that what the crowd was thinking they were going to do, and he knew it. So he just kind of backs away. Does his little Jesus Jedi trick. What what. Satan tried the same thing with him when he tempted him. Remember when he took him? Yep. Jesus had the 40-day fast. Satan shows up. He First he told him, he said, make bread. This you're is hungry. what I'll give you. This, it, make mm-hmm. bread. Jump off the temple. And he, when he told him to jump off the temple, he quoted scripture. Here's Satan quoting scripture, which I thought was interesting. And then the third one, he took him up on a mountain. And I don't know if this is in their mind or they trans. I don't know how it all happened. But somehow they're up on a mountain looking. He said, look at this. He's looking at the whole, you know, all these people. Satan's like, these are mine, but if you'll bow the knee to me, we can do this together. And Jesus said, I serve the Lord God only. In other words, I'll never bow the knee to you. And so what struck me about the sermon, and I made the point, is this last week we've seen a lot of this kneeling concept that we're for this movement or whatever. At at a protest. At a protest. And and then even trying to force people to kneel. And there was a – I just saw – a couple of days ago, there was a black state trooper in Georgia, and they're trying to, you know, control the crowd. And they're starting in on him about trying to make him kneel before the crowd for this for the for the cause. And he said it what I said in my sermon. He looked at them, and the only thing he said through the he's just mostly looking at them. They're yelling at him, calling him names. He said, "I bow the knee to one." That's what that state trooper said. And I thought that was kind of the point of my sermon is that if we bow our knee to Jesus. <clears throat> We yeah. don't have to get into these causes and all this. I don't bow my knee to any man, the president of the United States, anybody. I bow my knee well, to Well, or Jesus. for any reason. Any cause, it, any ideology. Because right. a lot of people say that it's a sign of protest, but when you think about what we do to Jesus, which comes back to this same thing, it's hard sometimes to see victory through bowing the knee or surrendering. But... That's the way, that's the path to victory. Because you think about this. Who are we to dictate anything to God or Jesus about anything? Yeah. Uh, we don't take him by force. We don't demand things. We don't come up with a plan and say, God, do this. This is our plans. I mean, it's the complete opposite. We, right. we bow the knee to Jesus and we say, use us if, if- however you see fit. If somehow we would try to go forward, either in our faith or even in our country, with the idea that we're going to make demands that you have to do this, think about where that runs itself out. And some of the crazy stuff that's happening. I mean, you've got now a city saying, you know what, we're just going to get get rid of the police force. Ooh. Let me just tell you something. That's going to be a bad idea. Oh. I, I'm going to go on record as saying that's not going to work. You're not going to believe how fast they go get off of it's that. It's terrible. So, but it, again, it's that uh-huh. idea, and this struck me as that. And I, I guess, Jason, I'd never thought about it before because you said it early on. The last time we talked about this, the evil one is the architect. When you see this mm. much damage that's to right. people and division, because John Ten said he came to steal, kill, and destroy. And I would add to that divide. But it's not just in the unbelieving world. I'm putting that in quotation right, that's, that's marks. Right. It you know because when it says the evil one, when Paul said in Corinthians where he said the you know Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Mm. It, it's not like when you said he quoted verses. He did. It's not as clear cut as you think. Oh, all you know, it's obvious these people who are un-American and don't don't love humans and look at this opportunity as you know an opportunity to 
create chaos. Right. It, it's kind of obvious to see that. You're right. thinking, well, this is not, that's not right. What's harder is what we're talking about on, you know, how do you protest something? And that's why I started saying, you protest things by surrendering to Jesus and introducing him to other people. That That's your answer. That's your, that's your protest against injustice. Yeah. I mean, we hate injustice just as much Absolutely. as any, any other it people. It makes me sick. I, yeah, it makes me nauseous when yeah. people make a decision at the color of someone's skin. I mean, that that is nauseating to me because I'm yep. like, we're all different. That's right. Whether, you know, we're not really, me and you are not exactly the same color. I mean, that that's just so silly to me. And I mean, whatever the racist skin color is, I'm just as disgusted. If it's a white guy that's racist towards somebody else, that disgusts me oh, yeah. just as much as it does any other form of racism. But you got to remember, we draw so much attention to it. I'm like... I would love to live in a society where we don't notice that anymore. Yeah, it'd be great. But it's like on both sides of the issue, everyone wants to be noticed, right. you know, on what color we are and, and the things that happen. That's why I'm saying Jesus is where we we drop we drop down to our knees. And you say, Why? Because he controls the molecular structure of all things and everything he represents, like you quoted on Thomas Jefferson, he couldn't get around, is right. Yep. He is true. He always valued people, every right. person. Right. So I'll close with this. Uh, man, that seemed to go by fast. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. This is how I close my sermon. So in Christ Jesus, you are all, all, that's all lives, and they do matter, children of God through faith for all, all lives, all of you were baptized into Christ who were, have clothed yourselves with Christ. That's what we're talking about, Jess. We're, mm-hmm. What we see is Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. Which, think about that statement. That that included all the races right there. Everybody. There's neither slave nor free. Which is all kind of classes of, it's not like what That's we right. think of modern day slavery, but this is all classes of people. Nor is there male or female. No gen, this gender stuff. All one. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I mean, you want to find true equality, you'll find it in Jesus. That's Amen. it. Amen. <coughs> it's a good statement to end on. So we're so glad you guys were with us today. You can subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or YouTube or Facebook. And be sure and rate us on iTunes so that other people can know about the podcast.